praise the Lord again. We certainly do thank God. Had a little difficulty, uh, but the devil is alive. <laughs> so we certainly do once again thank God for allowing us to, to be here on today. And by way of announcements, we just want to announce that um, you can join us on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock for our Bible studies. And you can join us also on Sundays at uh, 9.30 a.m. for our Sunday school and for our 11 o'clock uh, morning worship hour. Uh, also, too, we want um, those that uh, are here uh, and looking to give their tithes and their offerings, um, you can do that using Tidely. Um, just download the app and find Christian Ministries and you can give that way. Uh, you can also give by dropping your uh, tithes and your offerings in our secure drop box, or you can mail them to Christian Ministries of the Apostolic Faith Church, 501 West 31st Street, Erie, PA, 16508. So we certainly do thank God and praise God uh, for your giving, and the Lord continue to bless you. And we are looking forward to the opportunity to where we all come back together again uh, and worship. I'm supposing in my own mind, I haven't been official, but I'm looking probably at another three weeks, we'll be able to come together. And um, I look for God to make a move. And um, when we do come together, I want to continue uh, to enforce our uh, social distancing uh, the hand washing, using hand sanitizer. Uh, I won't be mad at you if you even wore a mask. Uh, put your mask on, bring them to church. Amen. Uh, anything that you can do to be saved and safe. Um, but we need um, us to come back together again and to worship God in spirit and in truth. Uh, I believe I don't wash my hands so frequently now. Uh, it's, a, it's a habit. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Everything I do, everything I touch, I'm washing my hands. And let us continue to, um, with our protocol, to disinfect uh, our church uh, before and after service. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We want to be clean, we want to be saved, and we want to be holy. So we let's um, look into our word on today, because I thank God, and your time is precious. I thank God for you. And for everyone that has came online and those that are here uh, at Christian Ministries to lift up the name of Jesus. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Just a short prayer for the word. Gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, that you grant the door of utterance. Send forth an anointing. Uh, bless your people. Bless me, thy servant. Let your word have its free course. Lord, you save and add to the church daily such as should be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. And here at Christian Ministries, we are a caring fellowship, uh, leading souls to Christ, strengthening members and family, making disciples, equipping them for service and community ministry. And our purpose is also to promote and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ through effective, responsible ministry and intentional, creative, dynamic fellowship. We also value, we have core value. We value love, persistence, and patience. And we value commitment, sacrifice, and service. And also our motto is pursuing excellence until excellence is achieved. So we certainly do thank God as we prepare our hearts for the inflow. We're preparing our hearts for the overflow. We're preparing our hearts for what the Lord is about to do in our midst. So I want you to turn with me uh, briefly uh, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter number two, sorry. Acts chapter number two. For we also believe here that, as you're finding that particular scriptures out of Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, it says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. And those thoughts are God's plans. So God says, I know the plans that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Plans 
of peace. God has thoughts towards us that are plans of peace, not of evil, and to bring us to his expected end. And we uh, truly believe that God is in our midst, that God is in our lives, orchestrating and, and moving and causing his perfect will to be done. Uh, that's why we live out the scripture that says, uh, the scripture that says, uh, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And truly that's the mantra of our lives uh, in walking with the Lord, that we know that everything that happens, it happens uh, for our good. Uh, because God is working in our lives. And though it may not feel good, may not, may not look good, and in essence, it may not be good, but God will cause it to work together for good because we love him. Thank you, Lord. So as you have found that scripture in the book of Acts, chapter number two, and I just got one particular verse of scripture I'm going to read. Um, and I want you to, at you at home, uh, I want you to read it with me. Uh, Acts chapter number 2 and verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom he hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let us read it again. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And just because it's just us that are here, we just want to read it one more time so it can get into our spirit. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And I want to take a thought uh, from today, or four, and from that twenty, from that thirty-six verse, uh, He is Lord and Christ. He is Lord and Christ. He is Lord and Christ. And this particular chapter begins uh, with us uh, starting out on the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost, Pentecost means 50. And it relates to uh, 50 days after the Passover. They had, the Jews had three major feasts the Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, the Passover feast was, uh, was commemorating the Jews coming out of Egypt. And y'all know the story where uh, God told them to get together, leave Egypt in a hurry, and put the, put the blood over the doorposts. All the firstborns are going to be killed. But when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And they were to commemorate that feast on a yearly basis, on a yearly basis to remember what the Lord had done in liberating them and freeing them. And I want to say this, is that um, that whole feast and that which Lord had done liberating them and freeing them, he did that so that they wouldn't be able to necessarily serve their own selves, but that they would be able to serve the Lord. When the Lord saves us and he liberates us from a life of sin and shame, he does not do that so you can serve yourself, but he does that so you can be free to serve him, to serve the Lord. And they went through a wilderness experience so that they could strip themselves of the old world, and that's the process of sanctification. We should go through a process of sanctification, a place of wisdom, a wilderness experience to strip ourselves from the old world 
And then we enter into the promised land as they entered into the promised land to enjoy the promises of God. Hallelujah. And that's what we should do once we strip ourselves and sanctify ourselves from this world. We should enter in and live in the promises of God, a land that flows with milk and honey. So in getting back to the day of Pentecost, it was 50 days uh, after the Passover. And uh, this particular event, it was a celebration uh, and God had made sure that everybody that was of every nation there at that particular time. Because it was not only uh, the day of Pentecost, but it was also the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee represents a time wherein all debts would be forgiven. That everybody would get a zero balance, so to speak, and they would start afresh, they would start anew. So at this particular day of Pentecost, all debts were going to be forgiven uh, through Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. And everybody would start out with a new uh, life, a new debt toward God, a fresh living life. That's why the scripture says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So God made sure that every person or every nation under heaven at that time were there in Jerusalem uh, so that uh, they would experience the Pentecostal experience. And this, as you know, in chapter one, God had set them up uh, through the words of Jesus Christ he told his disciples to go to Jerusalem. Uh, he told them, tarry there, wait. Thank you, Lord. Don't go anywhere else, but wait in Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. Uh, asked Jesus a question. They said, Lord, at that time will thou restore the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord told him, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which God has placed in his own power. But he said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then he said, you're going to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world. And they believed what Jesus said. He had given them commandments after he had showed himself alive for 40 days. And he had taught them about the kingdom of God. So as we see here, that 120 souls were in the uh, upper room, had had an upper room experience. Thank you, Lord. And the Bible says there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house that they were at. Uh, and the Bible says that there were clothing tongues, divided tongues that landed upon each of them, and they all spake in tongues or a new language as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And the people that were there, that experienced uh, what was going on, they said to themselves in amazement that, what does these things mean? Because we hear all of them speak, because they're Galileans. We hear all of them speak uh, in our own tongue, in our own native language, the miracles and the wonderful works of God. Hallelujah. They were, when they had that Holy Ghost fell on them, they spoke intelligently uh, in, in, in a different language. And they spoke about the miracles, signs, and wonders, and the marvelous works of God. And that intrigued them. Notice, God in every nation there. The Holy Ghost is for everybody. Thank you, Lord. And, and when they inquired about it, uh, some said to themselves, these are miracles that these people are speaking, what mean of this? And then some said that they were drunk. Hallelujah. A lot of people oftentimes get the wrong interpretation of what God is doing. Uh, sometimes you've got to be spiritual minded to understand the flow and the process of God. And then Peter, Peter full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, he stood up among them and he said, men and brethren, these men, uh, are not drunk as ye suppose uh, 
He said, seeing that it's but the, the, the third hour, meaning that it was nine o'clock in the morning. He said, these men are not drunk as ye suppose. But he said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He said that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And he said that God was going to do this and that it shall come to pass that all that call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That everybody that calls on the name of Jesus, they shall be saved. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. And that brings us then to uh, Peter. He begins to preach a dynamic sermon. He begins to preach the first sermon. In other words, he was literally about to open up the doors of the church. And as they gathered around him, my God, Peter began to preach and say, ye men of Israel, hear the words of Jesus Christ. He said he's a man that is approved of God among you through miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, that God himself empowered him and gave him power to perform these miracles, signs, and wonders in your midst. And I he told him that you were there and you saw when Lazarus was raised from the dead. You were there, you saw when the woman with the issue of blood said, if I can but just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. He, he said, you were there when I fed the multitude, when Jesus fed the multitude with fishes and loaves of bread. You were there when he held back the elements of the wind and the sea and said, peace be still. He said, you were there, my God, when Jesus walked on that water, defied the laws of gravity. And God allowed you to see those signs proving that Jesus was the anointed Christ. You were there when you saw it, my Lord. You were there when you heard him teach with wisdom heard him teach with knowledge and understanding. And those words that Jesus spoke, yeah, the Bible says, never a man spake like he had spoken before. He spoke with power. He spoke with authority. Ah, and he said, Peter said, you were there when Jesus did these things. Ah, he was approved of God. He was God's anointed. God had put power in his tongue, put power in his life. God had put power and authority upon him to perform these great miracles, signs, and wonders. And then Peter, Peter turned the tables and he said that ye by your hands, by the uh, uh, determinate counsel of God and the foreknowledge of God, ye have by your own hands taken him and crucified him and hung him on a tree. Peter was saying that it was God's determinate counsel that Jesus would be the lamb that would be slain before the foundation of the world. That God gave him over uh, to the Roman soldiers so that those soldiers would crucify him, that the soldiers would beat him, that he would be wounded for your transgressions, that he would be bruised for your iniquities, and the chastisement of your peace would be laid upon Jesus Christ. Ah, the Bible says that it pleased God to bruise him, and he was bruised for you and I. He suffered for you and I, and that was all a part of God's predeterminate counsel. That was all a part of God's foreknowledge, uh, that Christ, that Jesus Christ would be the lamb that would be slain before the foundation of the world, that he would give his life for a ransom for you and I. The scripture says that verily for a righteous man would some die, for adventure for a good man would even dare to die. Some would even dare to die. But God, he commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, in that while we were yet Dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah, my brother, uh, Adam and Eve sold us out, 
But Jesus Christ, uh, he gained us the victory. Jesus Christ gained us the victory. And the victory is in Jesus. And Peter was telling the crowd that were there that, that they did it. Uh, how did they do it? They turned them over to the Roman soldiers. And the Roman soldiers, they took them to the cross. They beat them unmercifully. My Lord, they humiliated him. They parted his garments, his raiment. Uh, they pierced him in the side. Out came water, out came blood uh, for our remission and for our redemption. They planted a crown of thorns on his head, hallelujah, and said uh, that here he is the king of the Jews. And they wrote it in Greek, they wrote it in Hebrew, and they wrote it in Aramaic language so that all that would know, hallelujah, that this man claimed to be the son of God. But the Bible says, Peter went on to preach, that who God had raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. In other words, it was impossible that death shall hell hold him in its power. It's impossible for Jesus to be held by the pains of death. Yea, he went into the ground, he suffered and he died, but he got up. He got up because death couldn't hold him in the ground. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Hallelujah. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But my God, thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ought to know that there's victory in Jesus. We ought to know that there's deliverance in Jesus. Ah, uh, if this a man shall die, shall he live again? Yea, if he's with Jesus, if that spirit be in you that raised Christ from the dead, it shall also quicken your mortal body. Hallelujah. And Peter, Peter begins to gain their attention. Thank you, Lord. And then he takes them to the book of Psalms, Psalm 16, and specifically verses number 8 through 11. Peter begins to tell him, hallelujah, that this Jesus whom you crucified, whom you uh, put to death, was the one in whom God had chosen. He's the one whom God has chosen. And he said that Jesus, he began to prophesy out of that book of Psalms, Psalms 116 or Psalm 16, verse number 8. And he says, I have set the Lord always before me. He's talking about God. Jesus talking about his father. Jesus talking about his father. He says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is on my right hand, so I shall not be moved. In other words, Jesus was saying that I've always had acknowledging and understanding of my heavenly father while I was here on this earth that I would not be discouraged, that I would not let anybody discourage me because my face is set like a flint, that I came to give my life as a ransom for many, and I will not be discouraged. I shall not be moved. My friend, anytime in this life you put your focus on God, and God will be with you so that you shall not be moved. You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, you shall not be moved. And that's what Jesus was saying. He was saying that I, I set the Lord always before me. I've all, I realize that I'm always in his presence. Hey, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there is joy forevermore. You should realize that when you always are in the presence of the Lord, wherever you go, you should realize that the Lord is with thee. Wherever you go, you should realize that the Lord has already gone before thee to prepare the way. You are not alone. That's why he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. My Lord, we can't hide from the presence of the Lord because the Lord is always nigh thee. He says, I'm nigh thee even in thy mouth. 
And that's what Jesus was saying. That's what gave him the courage and the strength to do what he needed to do to lay his life down as a sacrifice for you and I. But notice what Peter said. My God, he said, verse number nine, the scripture says, therefore, my heart is glad. Uh, when you realize that the Lord is with you, your heart needs to be glad, filled with joy. That's why James said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. You can count it all joy because the Lord is with thee. He said, the Lord is on my right hand, so I shall not be moved. The right hand represents a, a, a position of power and authority. You got to know, brothers and sisters, that the Lord is with us. He's on our right hand that we should not be moved. Notice what Jesus said in this psalm that was prophesied about his own words. My Lord, I'm trying to get through this thing, but it's getting gooder and gooder. It's getting sweeter and sweeter. Hey, hallelujah. He said, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. Thank you, Lord. My flesh shall rest in hope. Notice what he says. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. You see, Jesus was, well, uh, he went to the grave. He went to the cross realizing that his soul would not be left in hell. Neither would his soul be able to see corruption. We know that through Lazarus, Lazarus was in the grave for four days and he saw corruption. Jesus was in the grave. He was in the grave for three days, hallelujah, and saw no corruption. He realized that he would not be left there because upon this gospel, ah, he had to be raised. Upon the power of this gospel, he had to get up out of the grave. If he had not gotten up, we would be all men most miserable. If he had not gotten up, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sin. But because he lives, we can live also. Because he lives, we can live again. Hallelujah. And then Peter said, my God, Peter said, thank you, Lord, that, that Jesus would sit on the right hand of the Father, expecting with an expectation hey, that, that, that his enemies would become his footstool. And that particular scripture is very pivotal in our lesson text here today because Peter, he begins to equate that psalm to Jesus Christ. He begins to tell him that out of the book of Psalm that God promised that one of his descendants, the descendant of David, would sit upon the throne forever. That God himself showed from a prophetical puff of position that it would be through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he would not abandon him in hell, but God would raise him from the dead. Hey, and then Peter said that Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's exalted and he's received the promise of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Which made this event to happen. In other words, Peter took a roundabout way in telling them it was that Jesus whom God had raised from the dead. Uh, and gave him power and he's seated at the right hand of God and gave him a promise that he would send forth the Holy Ghost uh, that he would send forth the power you remember in the book of St. John my God where Jesus was teaching his disciples St. John chapter 16 he said I've got to go away hey if I don't go away uh, I can't, the comforter can't come and the comforter, when the comforter comes, he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you into all truth. When the comforter comes, it's not going to speak of myself, but it's going to speak of him. Hallelujah. And the words, hallelujah, that I give unto him to speak about me. Thank you, Lord. And he told him that when the comforter comes, when the Holy Ghost comes, you're going to rejoice. You're going to be glad. Hallelujah. And I won't leave you comfortless. And Jesus, hallelujah, was true to the word of God. And we know that Jesus reached his destination because his destination was heaven. And he sat down at the right hand of God. 
And God has said forth this, when Peter was saying, what you hear and see in your eyes are the Holy Ghost with power. Hallelujah, my God. We ought to thank God for the power. We ought to thank God for the Holy Ghost. Hey, the Bible says he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And that encouraged me today because the scripture says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You got to let the spirit of God lead you. You got to let the spirit of God guide you in the name of Jesus. And then Peter, in my conclusion of the lesson here today, Peter said unto them, he said, therefore, hallelujah, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Let everybody know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Hallelujah, let everybody be assured without any hesitation, my Lord, without any hesitation or possibility of mistake. Hallelujah, that, that God has beyond a doubt, my Lord, made him both Lord and Christ. Uh, even Jesus, uh, whom you crucified. And as Jesus, hallelujah, as Peter begins to talk, hallelujah, he made him Lord. Hallelujah, which means that he is the master. In other words, Adam and Eve sold us out. Hallelujah, when you call Jesus Lord, you're calling him by the highest confession of who he is. It's a high confession of who he is. He is the Lord, the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth. Adam and Eve sold us out uh, under sin and we lost dominion. But because Jesus Christ, hallelujah, born of a woman, made under the law, came into this world, gave his life as a ransom for you and I, he purchased redemption. Hey, hallelujah, he purchased the victory for you and I, so to put us back in our rightful position to have dominion. I see why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Thanks be to God that give us us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He's Lord over our lives. He's Lord, thank you Lord, over heaven and earth. He's Lord. Ha, he's the ruler. And the Bible says that no man can call Jesus a curse. Hallelujah. Thank you Lord. But he says, you can't call him Lord except by the Holy Ghost. If you've got the Holy Ghost, then you've got the seal of, 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 of appreciation that you believe that he is the Lord. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you've been sealed by the day of, to the day of redemption. And you've got power. Power to do what? Power to live right. Power to talk right. Power to lay hands on the sick so that they can recover. Power to tread on serpents and scorpions. You got power. Hallelujah. You got power in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your storm, if because Jesus Christ is Lord. And notice what he said. The God hath made him both Lord and Christ. Thank you, Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one. Thank you, Lord, who is both prophet, king, and priest. Thank you, Lord. He's the one that has all redemption, all glory, all power. Thank you, Lord. In him dwelleth the Godhead bodily. Hallelujah. He has the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus has redemptive power. Jesus has redemptive strength. And everybody that trusts in him, everybody that has confidence in him, they shall be delivered. The Bible says that he is the foundation. He is the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. Which the builders said it not. But the same has become the head of the corner. Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. Hallelujah. And you shall not be confounded if you put your trust in him. And as Peter, in my conclusion, as Peter begins to preach that message, and Bible says with many other words and other confessions did Peter make 
in their midst about Jesus. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that they were pricked in their heart. Hallelujah. Those that heard the word, those that heard the word of God, they were pricked in their heart. Now let me tell you, brothers and sisters, why they were pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart because Peter told them that the Lord, hallelujah, the one has set him on the right hand until his enemies became his footstool. And he was letting them know that the reason why they became pricked in their heart because they had crucified the Messiah. They had put to death Jesus Christ, the one in whom God has sent to redeem their souls, the one whom God has sent that was spoken of by Abraham, spoken of by Moses, spoken of by David, the one who all the prophets told them about. They were guilty because they rejected the Lord and his Christ. Uh, anytime that you reject God, you reject Jesus. Anytime you, you don't serve God, you don't serve Jesus. Uh, anytime you don't worship the king, you don't worship his Lord. Hallelujah. And they were felt sorry for what they had done. So the Bible says that they were pricked in their heart. My friend, we ought to be sorry if we don't serve the Lord Jesus. We ought to uh, be pricked in our heart. We ought to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is Lord. Anytime that you don't serve the Lord, you turn your back on the Lord, you crucify him afresh. Anytime you reject the word of God, you crucify him afresh. Anytime you turn your back on the people of God, anytime you turn your back on people who don't even know God, you crucify him afresh. Oh, my friend, we are going to be sorry for the things that we do. Their hearts need to be pricked. And notice when their hearts were pricked, uh, they said, men and brethren, oh, God, men and brethren. I can hear them in my soul saying, men and brethren, we're sorry. What shall we do? Uh, and Peter, thank God for Peter. Peter had the answer. He told them to repent. Ah, be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins and ye shall be filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. And notice what he said. If you've done anything wrong to God, uh, you ought to repent. That word repentance, it really means, it doesn't have an emotional connotation to it. Uh, you can come up crying and snotting and tearing. That doesn't mean that you repented. Repentance means that you have a change in your mind, a change in your thought to go in a different direction, to do things differently. That's what true repentance is, that you change your heart, that you change your mind, that you go in a different direction. There's a lot of things that I, because I got caught, I felt sorry for. There's a lot of things, I'm sure, because you got caught and you felt sorry for, but the next opportunity, you did it again. Well, that's not true repentance. True repentance is when the Lord comes upon your heart and leads you to godly sorrow and you realize that what I'm doing, it makes no sense, so I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to change my way of thinking. That's what Peter was telling them. Change your way of thinking. Turn from your wicked way. He said, if my people that were called by my name, if they would humble themselves and pray, if they would seek my face, notice, and turn, and turn, and turn from their wicked ways. He said, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sins. Then will I heal their land. When you repent, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you repent, it causes heaven to open up. It causes heaven to open up with his resources. It causes heaven to open up with deliverance, with power, with deliverance, with strength, with glory, with mercy, with grace, with power, and with forgiveness. When you open up to God, God opens up to you and he restores your mind. He restores your body. Hallelujah. And when Peter told them, 
He said, I need you to repent. Because he's both Lord and Christ. They realized that they had done a terrible thing. Hey, glory. They realized that they have done some things that, that was wrong, that they needed to turn for. Oh, when you realize Jesus Christ is Lord, you realize that he is the Christ. You realize that there's no other way that a man can be saved but through Jesus Christ. When you realize that the gospel message of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. When you get tired of your ways, when you get tired of losing, when you get tired of losing, when you get tired of falling short, you ought to repent and turn to Jesus. Turn to the victor. Turn to the one who has gained you the victory. Turn to the one who has gone through the press, gone through the storm, hallelujah, gone through your tests and trials. I hear Isaiah saying, who is this? Coming from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra. This is Jesus Christ traveling in the greatness of his strength. Mighty to save. Hallelujah, my God. Hallelujah, he's mighty to save you. He's mighty to deliver you. There's no other salvation given under heaven whereby men must be saved. And that's through Jesus Christ. That's through the Lord and Savior. So Peter said, repent. Hey, then he told him. Hey, after your hearts have been changed, be ye baptized. Ah, in other words, get baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness. That's what the word remission means. It means forgiveness. When you repent, God automatically forgives you. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. My Lord, a lot of us have done a lot of dirt. Ah, and if you want to get that guilt off of you, all you need to do is repent. If you want to get that shame off of you, all you got to do is repent. Hallelujah. Because Jesus, the, he died on the cross for you. And he being that perfect sacrifice. Not the blood of bulls. Not the blood of goats and heifers. Uh, they offered no sacrifice up daily. Hallelujah. But they still had a level of condemnation. But the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. I'm tired of the enemy trying to kick me down for the things that I've done, for the things that I've done. I hear Paul saying, I'm forgetting those things that are behind and I'm reaching for those things that are before me and I'm pressing toward the mark the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So you've got to repent, be baptized. Hallelujah. And God will fill you with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. My God, when you get the Holy Ghost, you're going to have power. When you get the Holy Ghost, you're going to have joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hey, if it can't take me higher than the Holy Ghost, then I don't want it. I don't need it. If it can't take me higher than the Holy Ghost, I don't need it. Hallelujah. There's power in the Holy Ghost. That power. Thank you, Lord. Not only does the Holy Ghost give you a good feeling, but the Holy Ghost gives you strength. Hallelujah. Strength to be able to resist the enemy. The Holy Ghost leads you into all truth. My God, the Holy Ghost is multi-purpose. Hallelujah. It'll convict you of sin. Hallelujah. It'll, it'll show you the judgment of sin. Hallelujah. And it'll show you uh, the righteousness of God. My Lord, that's why you need the Holy Ghost. And if you die, hallelujah, go to the grave. If that spirit be in you that raised Christ from the dead, it shall quicken, make alive your mortal body. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost. Somebody say Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is real. The Holy Ghost has power. The Holy Ghost has deliverance. And not only that, it will manifest in you the mind of Christ. I see why Paul said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, uh, which is your reasonable service. Uh, and be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
That's why you need the Holy Ghost to get the mind of Christ. It's the spirit of Christ to tell you how to operate, how to have the right mindset, have the right attitude concerning the things that be of God. Hallelujah. And when they heard that, Peter preached to them, my Lord, that he's Lord and that Jesus is the Christ. The Bible says that as many as heard him, they were all baptized. Hallelujah. The many as received it, they were all baptized. And the scripture says that at that day, Peter had a mega church. At that day, over 3,000 or 3,000 souls were saved. And the Lord added daily such as should be saved. I couldn't imagine. And sometimes as a pastor, I sit here thinking, man, if I had to baptize 3,000 souls, that'd take me all day and all night. I had to commission me some deacons. Hallelujah. I had to commission me some workers. Hallelujah. So we can get them saved. Hallelujah. So we can get them saved. And notice, hallelujah, that every time one of them went in the water, they came up with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They came up out of that water with power. Oh, my God. I couldn't imagine so much anointing all in one place. I couldn't imagine so much re re repentance and salvation and deliverance happening all in one place. Can you imagine? Hallelujah. Oh, what a time. Hallelujah. What a time. A time of rejoicing. A time of giving of thanks. What a celebration. Hallelujah. And they were all saved. Hallelujah. Because Peter pricked their heart by telling them that Jesus is the Lord and he is Christ. My friend, if you've done anything wrong in your life, there's no sense in trying to run and hide. The Lord has seen it. In fact, he was there when you did it. Hallelujah. But he said it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. God would want you to repent. And if anybody wants to talk to me, Pastor Quinn, you just put your name and number in my box. Tell me to call you and I'll call you. Hallelujah. And I'll pray with you. And if you repent fully, I'll baptize you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he's Lord. Yeah, because he's Christ. Hallelujah. And, and live a holy life. Live a righteous life. Because Jesus is soon to come. Jesus is soon to come. We thank you. Hallelujah for these words that we've heard on today. My Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus is the Savior. That he is the Deliverer. My Lord. And because he saves, because he delivers, we can live again. Put your trust in Jesus and everything shall be all right. The Lord is on our right hand that we should not be moved. Because he is on our right hand, we should not fail, we should not be moved, and we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. Let us pray, gracious Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for these words here on today. We thank you, Lord, for those that are hearing this word, this gospel message of Jesus Christ being preached. Lord, be near us. Stand against all our enemies and provide all that we need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, protect us from things viral, chemical, biological, physical, both things in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. Lord, give us power and authority that we may execute your will in the name of Jesus. Lord, restore unto us our dominion over the seen and the unseen, over the natural and the supernatural. Father, in the name of Jesus, keep us and watch over us. Hallelujah. And cause us to be able to stand. Hallelujah. Until you return. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ah, clap your hands and give God a praise. I thank God for you tuning in on today. And I thank God for my audience that are here with me. Hallelujah. I praise God for them for sacrificing. Thank God for our praise team. Thank God for all others. My lovely wife. Thank God for the saints of God. 
Hallelujah. Now, mostly, I thank God for our assignment. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. I thank God for being a pastor. I thank God for being a saint. Hallelujah. A servant of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's the highest order. It's the highest calling one can ever receive. And I thank God that he counted us worthy. Yeah, he looked beyond all of our faults and he saw our need. So let us come together again with rejoicing. Let us come together again with thanksgiving until we meet again on Wednesday at 6 p.m. for Bible study. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Hallelujah. And do good ah, to your fellow man and stay in social distancing and stay corona free. In Jesus' name.